little bit more to cover today, so I want to get started with this, and we'll sing a, sing a song at the end. As we, we progress and evolve and change as a, as a fellowship, as a church, as a community, so Lisa and I give a lot of thought, time, and prayer into God, what direction He wants to go, what should we add, what should we change, and we constantly looking for inspiration and leadership from the Holy Spirit, and some of that comes through you and what you're sensing and feeling God is calling us to do. But in my own personal thinking about the purposes of our church and some of the values that we live by, I have felt that we needed to add one more piece to the puzzle. Can anybody guess what that piece is? Me. What is it? There's two you! There are two pieces that I've added to the puzzle. Correct me. And you are one of them, but you've always been a piece of the puzzle. But yes, it's been added as far as this PowerPoint goes. Yeah. I'll give you a hint. There's the first four original ones right there. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Connect, grow, share, serve, and give. Oh, great. This is a message on tithing. Not really. It's much bigger than that. It's much bigger than that. But I think this is fundamental, and I think it's a good word that kind of brings out a little bit more balance and rounds out the other four, because I think these are, these are all, they overlap, but yet they're separate. They're individual. And I think we need to talk a little bit about what it means to be a generous, giving person. And what the Bible calls us to be and to do in that area. Which is not a problem for most of you in here because you are generous. And you do give. You give of your time, your talent, and your treasure. So this will probably be a reaffirmation for many of you. And for others it may be a challenge. For others it may just inspire you to want to do even more. So I want us to start off with this opening question. How do we go from being a consumer to a steward. Would you agree with me that we live in a consumer mentality world? Yes. <laughs> Anybody have any thoughts on that? Anybody give me an example of how we we live in this consumer world? I love Amazon. Yes. <laughs> My wife is my lady. She we have stock in Amazon. Costco. Costco. Yeah. We, we live in a day and time in our modern world of, of hoppers and choppers and, and whatever we'll do, most for me, generally speaking, is what I'm going to buy into and where I'm going to be. We probably operate less by values and convictions and purposes and more by consumerism, which can, can be motivated by just selfishness, but not necessarily. So let's read through some of these questions. Let's start here. Keith, can you read that first question for us? Do I see other people's stuff and become critical or bored with my own? We're talking about consumer mentality, y'all. Okay? The consumer culture. You don't have to raise your hand and have us come over and lay hands and pray for you if you if you feel like this applies to you. But you can just agree with it in your own heart. Do I see other people's stuff and become critical or bored with my own? Oh man, look at his boat. I need to have a boat like that that actually runs. How nice would that be? They've got a four-bedroom house. Man, what could I do if I had a four-bedroom house? What if I could upgrade my truck to look like that guy's truck? I mean, it's a four wheels. It's a, ooh, the guy's driving into the base. they got some nice-looking trucks there. I look at those things sometimes and privately salivate a little bit as they drive by. But it's only God sees. We look at other people's stuff and maybe become bored with our own. Ah, I need bigger. I need better. I need more. And it's partly because that's the world we live in. And so we're, we're, it kind of rubs off on us in ways. Second question. Wes, read out for us. Do I buy compulsively without first thinking of my budget? Anybody have any thoughts on that one? What budget? Yeah. <laughs> what budget? Do you ever find yourself doing this one? Do you have an example of this one? 
What do they say? Don't ever go into a store not knowing what you want. Because <laughs> you come out with something you don't need. <laughs> yeah, we, we're probably all guilty of buying something compulsively without looking at that budget that we have written. You just look at the bottom line. I just look at the bottom line. Until Lisa does our budget, I just say, well, where, where are we? You know, we, we are, how close do we come to that bottom line? The third question, so Lisa. Is my circle of needs or wants getting bigger? Some bums, larger bums, and your car is extra. Yeah. Is it is it expanding? Gotta have a bigger house. Gotta have a more current, gotta have an iPhone or whatever it is now. Six. Gotta have our what? Ten. Ten. iPhone ten. Okay, iPhone ten. We look around and go, man, I tell Lisa sometimes. Just think how much of a blessing it's been to have that little duplex. Let me have one more duplex. Man, that would, that would be another, you know, another asset to the budget. We can just, and we, we kind of dream, you know, we're human beings, we dream about things like that for sure. But in your own life, is your circle of needs slash wants getting bigger? Do you find yourself adding to your possessions, maybe unnecessarily with things that you don't really need, it's just that you're spending money you don't have on something you don't need, which puts more pressure on you to pay bills that you wouldn't necessarily have if you didn't buy something you didn't need. Okay. Next question, Mario. Do I complain a lot about how much I make? Not so much. All right, everybody's happy with the wages are going up. We don't like it when they raise the funds on the seniors in the senior center. And the Social Security doesn't go up that much. Right. Yeah, right. At all. <laughs> you know, we need to let them know Social, Social Security needs to rise with the demands of the of the senior centers. You know, as they charge more money to play cards, Social Security needs to rise with that rising demand. Do I complain about how much I make? Ah, sometimes. I don't know if we hear that as much today in our culture as maybe years past. I think, I think there's plenty of jobs out there for sure. And the wages seem to be going up. The next one, Crystal. Okay, this is where some of you are going, oh no, now he's gone from that one here. Do I get less than 10% of my income to the ministry of the church? What do we call what do we call that phrase 10%? There's a word for it. Tithe. Yes. We call it a tithe. Now some people think tithe means offering. It actually doesn't. Tithe means 10%. And in the Old Testament, you will see, when you brought your tithe, you brought 10% of your harvest. 10% of what you were blessed with, 10% of your income. That is a tithe, different than an offering. But do I get less than 10% of my income to the ministry of my church? Something for us to think about. And finally, does it go me when the preacher talks about money? Nope. No, because I hardly ever talk about it, so you thought we're going to know it much. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I think I think at the heart of this, we're going to get into a little bit of the weeds and the nitty gritty on what it means to be a giving person. But I think it's way bigger than just church, just tithe, just contribution to a nonprofit organization. I think I think it it challenges us on a much deeper level of generosity in our soul. And are we? generous with what God has given us, do we understand all the factors going into that? So hopefully you don't get annoyed. I used to really get annoyed when preachers talked about money. And if I, if I saw it in the bulletin before Sunday, I'd be fishing on that Sunday. Because I just hate it to hear sermons begging people for money. That's why I've never done it probably to a fault on, on my behalf because it is part of Part of the Christian journey. Check this verse out. Valerie, can you read it for us? For this passage. The Bible offers 500 verses on prayer. Here are the 500 verses on faith, more than 2,350 verses on possessions and money. You think about that one? <laughs> the message. 
How many more times is that? <laughs> In the Bible is money and possessions addressed more than you would think the crucial doctrines of faith and prayer. And those are those are mentioned a lot. That's just interesting to me. It always has been interesting to me that there would be such a such a volume of scripture devoted to that and the and to the handling of that and the handling of the possessions around that. But I think I know why. And I'll, I'll get to why I think. Think that is. Now let's read our parable. Lots of parables. This is one of those possessions slash investment slash money scriptures in the Bible. So I'd like for us to read it. Gene, can you read that for us? Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbitrator between then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable, The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things. Well, oh, there's some of the top. Oh, I'm sorry. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you, then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be. Whoever stores up things for themselves is not rich towards God. All right, this is the parable of the rich fool. The parable of the rich fool. You'll notice the personal pronouns in this parable where you see the word my or yourself mentioned throughout. You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it would be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. So the question right off the bat that we have to ask ourselves is, are you rich toward God? Or do you take what you have, what you've been blessed with, and just accumulate more for yourself? And if we are rich toward God, I would think that would include at least 10% of what God has given to us. Wouldn't you think so? I would think probably, probably more. That's why in Acts, when you read about the apostles, you don't hear that word 10% in the early church. Because you know what they would often do? Sell their lands and their properties. Sell the second car. Take it, put it before the apostles' feet and say, here, I want to be rich toward God. Here's the money for my second car. Use it for the kingdom purposes. And that, I was going to get an upgrade to a newer boat, but I took the 20000 that I was going to upgrade to, and I'd like to give this to the ministry of the church to help the orphans and the widow, widows and the children. And I'd like, I'd like to take what I have. And so there's no stipulation, and it's almost a, a disservice to talk about a tithe because it's so minimal compared to what God has given to us. It's almost embarrassing to think that we would only give 10%, but yet we find that hard, don't we? I find it hard sometimes. I find it hard. But yet I don't have any problem wanting to take money, the other 90%, and get a second new plus so we can have more money. Or to get a nicer car, waiting on what I need so that we can have this. And I think in the end, what's going what's gonna to matter is, are we taking our resources, and are we stockpiling it for us, for us, for us? Well, you can say, well, no, I'm stockpiling it so my kids can get that one day. But look at the example you're setting. You're teaching your kids just to stockpile for themselves. Well, we're not being rich toward God. But what about, what about being rich to the kingdom? And taking what he has given us and laying it down to be used 
for the purposes of ministry for other people because that's going to be a legacy that will outlive you. Our houses will not outlive us. But what we give and what we sacrifice for beyond ourselves will outlive us. So that's that's the that's the idea of the rich parable. Oh, and I want to go back and notice a couple things here in this story. So he had abundant harvest. What shall I do with all my crops? I've been blessed. I've got all these great crops. And immediately, he's, he couldn't take these great crops. And what could he have done with the surplus of his crops? What could he have done with those? Share How? Share. Share. Yeah, he could have, that could have been his first thought. Man, I've been so blessed. I'm going to give what I have been blessed with at least. 10%, but however much, doesn't matter. I, I want to bless others. That wasn't his thought. His thought was, how can I use this to build bigger barns for me? Not how can I take what I've been blessed with and bless others, but how? And so he said, you have plenty of grain laid up for years. Take my easy to eat, drink, and be merry. So it's a matter of convenience. It's a matter of, it's a matter of personal but God said to him, you fool this very night, you're like, we require it. Okay, so, so we have this challenge before us. The challenge is, are you going to be rich toward God and sacrifice for yourself? Or are you going to be stingy toward God and accumulate for yourself? That's really the question. And why would, why would we want to be rich toward God? Which is a matter of time, talent, and treasure. Not just our money. But I find... That when it comes down to giving of our money, that's the one that people have the hardest time doing. Because it strikes right at the heart of our selfishness. So let's get to the tithing concept of giving. The tithing concept of giving, 10%, reminds us, first of all, so Lisa, can you read that? God is the source of what we have. Yeah, so when they would take their harvest that they had, the zucchini was really good that year. Or the, or the grapes, the grapes, there was a bountiful grape harvest. And they would take that to the storehouse and bring it in. The first thing they were saying is, hey, I didn't create these grapes. I didn't create my own hands. I didn't give myself my own bread. God gave me the strength to go to work. God gave me the breath to go to work. God, God created the harvest here. And it, it acknowledges that God is the source of what you have. So we're getting that right first. That's what it does by taking a tithe, our our money that we make, it says, hey God, you gave me the ability to make this, I want you to know, thank you. Thank you. And it acknowledges the source of God. Secondly, Lloyd, can you read that second one? It's an expression of generosity for all that you've given. Yes, not only does it acknowledge God as source, but it's our way to say, thank you. It's our way to say, God, you've been so good. How, how can I Let's just take our fellowship, for example, here. In this fellowship, I know God has answered prayer in many of your lives. In spiritual and profound ways, I know God has answered prayer. In what ways do we thank Him? We thank Him by praising Him in church. We thank Him by speaking to other people outside of church and saying, you know, God's been good to me. But perhaps one of the greatest ways we say thank you is honoring Him back with what He's given to us. And there's no price tag we can pay. There's no, there's no amount of giving, 20, 30, 40% we can ever pay for God's goodness that he's had to us in our lives. Would you agree? The very fact that, that Mario and Cheryl have a daughter named Elena, and Danny's wife, Brooke, met Elena, and from that, Elena got a job at Renown, and now she's flourishing and getting raises, I believe. I'm pretty sure... There's a generosity you feel in your soul to God for that? Oh, I know there is. Definitely. I'm pretty sure some of you have had answers, spiritually speaking, where you've broken through relationships that were fractured. Where you know what? You can't put a price tag on that. There's marriages that have been strengthened and increased as a result of some of the marriage programs we've had in our church. You can't put a price tag on that. So when it comes to sharing 10% of what we have, it's so small compared to the spiritual blessings and answers to prayer and the breakthroughs we've had in our life. It's like, heck, God, I'll give you everything. Well, what did you know? It's just money compared to what God has done for you, Zach. And and bumping into, you know, that guy, and, and you want to run and head out of town. I mean, that there's no price tag on that one. 
There's no price tag. So, so what, what we give to God is the least we can do out of a heart of generosity. And there's something about us giving financially, again, that is the ultimate in giving because that's the hardest thing for us to do. Because we feel like it's ours. It's not ours. It's His. It's His. Everything we have is His. We're just saying thank you back to the God who loaned it to us, gave it to us. The third one, Talisa. It shows that you believe in what you're getting toward. Yeah, so let's take this. If, if you contribute to, let's say you contribute to a college. And you, you help as an alumni, let's say you're an alumni, you support that college. What does that tell me about what you think about that college? Believe in it. You believe in it. You like it. You got something out of it yourself. And when you give towards something, it's, it's sending the message, I believe in this. I'm all in. I think I've seen shirts somewhere that say that. I'm all in. I believe in it. And I want to give toward what I believe in because it's helped me. I see the difference that it's making. I, I see that it's, it's changing lives. It's helping people. And I believe in that. Therefore, the giving financially is a way for me to support that and say, I believe in it. The next one. Mario. It opens up the door for God to bless you even more. Yeah, and this now we're starting to get into some juicy stuff here. Did you know that by being stingy, you keep the door closed for God to bless you even further? But when you take what you have and you give, it opens up the door and allows God to bless you. You know why? Because he can trust that if he blesses you, you're going to bless other people and not be stingy and keep it for yourself. When we're not generous, the door is closed. And we miss out on the blessings that God wants to give to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over because he can't trust us with blessing us because we just want to build bigger barns so we can put more of our stuff in the bigger barns rather than blessing him, giving back to him, using it for the good of other people's lives. Finally, it helps pay the bills and do the ministries of the church when you're involved where you're involved in being fed spiritually. And this is important because every one of us here know that it costs money to rent a facility like this, right? We're all, we all know that. And if you pay a pastor, that costs money. If we give donations to homeless bags, we give donations because that allows us to have homeless bags. One day when we're able to have enough donations, we're going to hire a children's pastor when those donations increase so that we can reach more families. But it costs money for everything we do to run a church. Now, we don't just give as, as because we're providing a service. And because I go to church, I give this much. They give this to me. I give this to them. If that's all it is, that's a, that's a pretty shallow reason. But we do know that part of giving allows us to have the church open so that God can do the things that he's done. By giving, we pay the bills to meet in a, meet in a place so the Lloyd can come here when we're not meeting here and tell people, sorry that we're not here, Danny. Uh, we'll be back next week. <laughs> and there's that very practical aspect of it. And that's just one more reason why it's important that we share and give as bountifully and as generously as we can because the more we have, the more ministry we can do. The more funds that the church has, the more we can hire people to do ministries, and the more God can use us as a community of faith. Let's read this. Sherry, will you read this first for us? Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out some more, much blessing, that there will not be room enough to store there's a saint in the church in Oakville where I used to go, and he would always say this. And man, he was a committed giver. He would always say, uh -huh. you can't outgive God. You just can't outgive God. And I'll tell you what, you can't. You can't outgive it. And especially when you give when you don't have it, that's when you open up the door for God to bless you even more 
And look at that verse. We're talking about, it's just talking about the tithe. I'm talking about offerings. We're not talking about bequests. This is just still talking about the 10% that God gives us an opportunity to give back to him and say thank you. He says, test me in this, says the Lord God, and see if I will not go open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough to store it. How much have we tested God by giving him way more than we thought we could so that he could bless us even more than we thought we could be blessed. Test me, God says. Test me and see. You try. I've known pastors who have said, hey, you give, you give 10% of your earnings to God, and after six months, if God hasn't blessed you, we'll give you your money back. I'm not willing to do that. But that particular pastor, <laughs> that particular pastor did that because he believed in the, in the principle of giving. And, and so do I. That when, when we're bountiful and generous with what God, let me take out this church in Hawaii. Man, it's this an interesting experience. I went to church. Talisa and the baby missed the bus, so I'm in Kaneohe, Hawaii. I have no idea what kind of church this is. Is they met in elementary school like this? I could. There was no place to put Kaisa, so for an hour and a half, I kept him in my lap. You know how hard it is to keep <laughs> little baby in your lap with our energy level for an hour and a half. But I'm sitting there, and somebody walks up to me with a with a welcome bag because I'm a new visitor. I said, oh, that's nice. And it had all kinds of cool things for guys to play with. And believe me, it didn't take him long. You know, it was slinkies. You know, he was rolling balls out the aisle during church. He was up walking, you know, greeting everybody himself, being a personal greeter. And then I looked at him and I thought, there's $31 bills. I thought, what, what is this? I thought, well, somebody has accidentally dropped their money in these $31 bills. I mean, dropped $31 bills in there. And I thought, okay, well, I don't know what to do with it, but I'll just, I'll put it in the offering. In the offering. And then they took a portion of the service, they stopped, and the pastor said, you know, we're going to do something we do a lot here. We're just going to bless each other. So you all know what that means. Take out your, take out your dollar bills and, and your fives, and they started the music, and everybody, little kids, like one kid came up to me, he couldn't have been over 10. He had some money folded up, and he handed it to me. He got down on one day and said, here, I just want to bless you today. Ten-year-old. And then the senior pastor himself, there were several hundred people there, walked from there, said, hey, uh, I'm Pastor Joel. I forget his name. I just want to bless you today. Hand me money. When I was out, I had $38. I mean, I could ride the bus six times in Hawaii for 38 bucks. And I've never seen anything like this. Where else can you go to church and leave with more money than you came with? And I thought, I, I felt guilty. I thought, this is, this is the most crazy thing I have ever seen in a church. He has so cultivated a culture of giving in that church that everybody just knew what to do. They had so much fun walking around and giving money to each other. And of course, when the offering, the offering plate never did come by, but I asked somebody, hey, where's he? the offering. Well, we don't really do it. Everybody just kind of walks up there. And everybody walks up and gives their offering in church so they take turns walking because they want it to be something they celebrate. They, they want to celebrate giving and generosity. And so I had another lady go put it in the offering plate because we had to go after an hour and a half of Kaisen. And she did that for me. And then they had a testimony time. They had a guy come up from the church that had been part of it since the church started. 18 years. This is a church plant. And this kid came up and he didn't want to talk so the pastor interviewed him. And the pastor said, so tell us uh, tell us what's been going on in your life. And this kid said, well, man, I struggle with giving. I've got a wife and I've got two kids back there. And to take 10% of my income that I make, he said, it was hard. And the pastor said, yeah, you know, I understand. He said, you've been part of this church for 18 years. And how has it changed you? How has it helped you? And this Kids said, you know what? All of a sudden, now, now it's not hard to give. My family is blessed. My wife thinks I'm a hero because I'm now giving to the church. And, and he said, I feel like I just spiritually broke it through. And he said, now I feel like I have victory in my life. And, of course, the whole place is clapping. But in this church was a culture that once you break through the whole selfishness of saying it's mine and you're able to give, of what God has given you, at least in the area of the tithe, it's like you've broken through that spiritual roadblock. And all of a sudden, you're free now. 
And it was, it was an amazing thing. And you'll never guess what the pastor preached on that day. Giving. <laughs> and in, I looked at their little order, I mean, their, their values. It's grow, serve, and give is one of their big things. So that's why you're doing this sermon today, Bonnie, that you went there. No, but what it does is it confirms something to me. It confirms to me, it confirms to me that you can't survive as a church unless the folks in your church are generous. You cannot survive. And we have to give not just our 10%, but whatever God lays on our heart. And many of you are faithful, committed givers. But I wonder how much of us take at least that 10% and say, God, you deserve more. I'm going to at least give you this. Because this, this is what a tithe is. And then you've been so generous, so good to me. How can, how can I ever withhold from you? I want to open up my life to blessing. So it was, it was quite an experience that I had. And I just thought, wow, what a spirit of generosity is in this church. So we're going to go from three shifts to going from a consumer to a steward. And then we're going to wrap it up. Three shifts. And I think this is really practical, good take-home stuff for us. The first shift, the first mini shift, Chad. First mini shift is from being spenders to savers. And I, when I get that, I'll be happy to. This is enough. Okay. Here's the first shift when it comes from being consumer to a steward. It's going from being a spender to a saver. This is very biblical. It's going from, when I get that new boat, I'll be happy to... No, the boat I have is enough. I'm content with what I have. That's the first shift. We go from being a spender, usually of money we don't have, to a saver. And actually doing what all the financial gurus tell us to do, of having some money put away and saving. That's the first mini shift. The second mini shift. Cheryl, will you read that one for us? The second mini shift is from saver to giver. Sociologists have long noticed a, a trend in the American giving. The more we have, the less we give. Isn't that interesting? And I found it to be true. Sociologists have long noticed a trend in American giving. The more we have, the less we give. I've always been blown away when I've traveled the country doing magic shows that the biggest tippers, most often times, are not the gated communities. It's the everyday common people. It's the everyday common people who oftentimes are the most generous. And why is that? It's because the more we have, the less we get. And it just seems to be true because that whole consumer mentality makes us just want to build bigger barns so we can buy more stuff, so we can have more for me. Instead of simplicity. The blessed is the person who is striving towards simplicity and generosity. The third shift, Annie? <clears throat> the third shift is from sharing to blessing. Consumers always want to be on the receiving end of this blessing, but stewards want to bless others. Ah, I like that. And that's many of you are that way in here. Consumers, they always want to be on the end of receiving. How can I get more? How can this benefit me? But stewards, stewards get blessed and become happy when they're able to give they're able to contribute, when they're able to help. And that's what we're called to do, according to the scripture, is not to be consumers of what he's given us, but to be stewards of what he's given us. It's not how much you have, it's what you do with what you have. I believe in the end, that's probably the, the final judgment criteria. It's not how much you have, but what you did with what you have. And did you share it? Were you generous with it? Were you first and foremost Faithful by bringing your tithe to him. And then, did you give him your time and your talent? All of that time, talent, treasure in a way that says, thank you, God, you are my source. And then from Soul Shift. Crystal, can you read this, of course? Generous people give before they are asked. They don't need clever gimmicks or slip or shirts or somebody's free book as a way of saying thank you. As a result, generous people often become rich so that they can yeah, I like that right there. As a result, generous people often become rich so that they can be even more generous. That's just so good and so true. And I, and I like that. 
Everybody knows it costs money to do a church. Everybody knows it costs money to do ministry. Everybody knows it costs money to do anything. And those people say, wait a second, I don't, I don't have to have, you don't have to get out and promise me a bunch of stuff that isn't true. You don't have to give me some slick campaign. I just want to give it. I want, I want to be a biblical steward of what God has given to me. And then a famous quote by someone famous. Our biggest problem is our own self-centeredness. The best way to deal with our self-centeredness is to become selfless in giving. You can talk about anything else in the world. Everything from obesity to fasting to commitment. But the minute you talk about partying with your finances, that's when people will oftentimes get stirred up and become mad. Why is that? Because it strikes right at the heart, right at the heart of self centeredness do you want to become a less self-centered person and be selfless? Start to give in a way that it becomes a cheerful, happy action. And where you become disciplined in it. And it begins to be the culture of your family and the culture of your life. Thoughts? Questions? I once heard that um, and I don't know who said it, it wasn't me, but it might have been Robert Morris, I can't remember, but uh, God's not, his intent isn't to bless us so we can build a bigger barn, his intent is to bless us so we can build a bigger table. Oh, that's good. I like that. And you know what I love about each one of us in this, is we all give in this place, our time, our talent, our treasure, but I want to challenge us to give more. I want to challenge us to be the best stewards that we can be of what God has given to us. So that you open up the floodgate for God to bless you. I'll share one quick story and then we've got, we've got to close. As you know, Talisa and I have been doing this three and a half years. And some of you may know this story, you may not know this story, but and I've been doing this, we've been doing this basically for free. If our if we could afford it, on the months we can afford it, we've been allowing the church to give us $500 stipend, which is still pretty small compared to the pastor's wife who works 20 hours a week with admin and myself trying to be the best pastor I can be and still work my secular job. So when we have it, we've been accepting that. When we don't, we have it. But it's been okay because it's on my heart to do it. This is what I'm called to do. Paul says, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. So that's how I feel. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. And then six months ago, Completely out of the blue came this text from the internet saying that there's a bonus for officers in a particular a re a retention bonus. In other words, if you sign up for another four years. But they said it didn't apply to me, and I was like, dang, I wish they did. Because it was a twenty thousand dollar bonus. But they take taxes out, so it's only fifteen thousand six hundred. Not that I'm counting. As it turned out, I did qualify. As it turned out, it was through a weird set of circumstances. I, I didn't qualify, but I didn't say anything to Zalisa. I didn't say a word. But, I, but in my mind, I'm thinking, God, we've tried to be faithful to you <laughs> by giving more than our 10%. Are you trying to bless us here? I thought, no, probably not. Everything, I kept checking in at our, at our, with, our, with Colleen and our resources there and our recruiting. And she said, well, oh, Chapman, I think your money's over the finance department. I think it just got to be dropped. I said, what? So I didn't say anything to her. I went over to finance and I said, hey, am I getting a retention bonus? Because I signed up for one and they said, well, yeah, child, look, it's dropping. Part of it's dropping tomorrow, $8,000 in your bank account. I said, it is? I called up Talisa. I said, hey, what are you doing for dinner tonight? She said, oh, I got some chicken out. I said, can we wait on that? Let's go to Dickie's and have some barbecue tonight. I went and I got a card. And in that card, what did I say? You remember? The first page you forgot, which was, you can't outgive God. 
That's what was on the first page. You can't outbid God. And then the second page, I think, said that. It was, what would you do if we got this amount of money? Anyway, long story short, we got the money. And it was a tremendous help. We were able to pay off some bills and do some great things. I just felt like, you know what? Some of you think, well, why didn't you put the church over any money? You got $15,000 spent on it. We spend as much as we can giving. And that's the way I want my life to be. And many of you are that way. And what a blessing it was, but you cannot outgive God. And that blessing, I believe, I believe led to other blessings in our lives of a spiritual nature. We give financially, but it, it results sometimes spiritually, which is the best thing in life. You know, it, it's not, it doesn't have to be a material blessing that we give back. Sometimes by our giving, that opens up a door for us to, to tear down a wall with someone we've been broken with for 20 years and it came out of our obedience to Christ so next week I'm going to share a big announcement with you next week be not afraid he said I are not leaving